T cells communicate with antigen presenting cells via specialized contact sites called immunological synapses. Microclusters of active T cell receptors and other signaling proteins form at the periphery of the synapse and move inwards to the structure's center, where their signaling activity is switched off. Active T cell receptors stimulate actin polymerization at the synapse periphery, and, like microclusters, the actin network also flows inwards. Disrupting the actin network inhibits T cell activation, but many questions remain as Janice Burkhardt from the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia explains. The challenge now is really to understand how the actin polymerization augments the downstream signaling events. And as for myosin, very much less was known. So we knew it was recruited to the synapse, but not exactly where it was with respect to the other synapse components. And studies really disagreed about whether myosin activity was important for T-cell signaling. So we wanted to resolve the questions about myosin's role and to ask what's driving the centripetal movement of actin and whether you need actin dynamics or just a static actin scaffold to support T-cell signaling. Burkhardt and colleagues first looked at the distribution of actin and myosin in the immunological synapses formed by T-cells plated onto cover slips coated with the T-cell receptor ligand CD3, defining three distinct regions of cytoskeletal organization. We found that actin and myosin have overlapping but distinct distributions. So actin density is highest out in the periphery in the lamellopodial region, and then there's the lamellar region where actin and myosin overlap, and in that region they move together centripetally in arcs. And then in the very center of the synapse, the sort of the cell body, there's very little actin and very little myosin. So uh, Alex Babich, the graduate student who, who did most of this work, did a lot of careful analysis of the rates of flow and found that the rate of the actomycin network centripetal flow slows down as a function of the radius of the cell. So the closer uh, you go towards the center, the slower the movement is. The centripetal or retrograde flow of the actomycin network could be driven by myosin contractility or by continuous actin polymerization at the periphery of the immunological synapse. Babich et al. therefore examined the effects of either preventing actin turnover using jasplaquinolide or of inhibiting myosin-2 activity. If we inhibit actin polymerization, the network would shrink in a myosin-dependent fashion. But if we inhibited uh, the myosin, we really had remarkably little effect on the, the movement of the network except that after several minutes, the network would become a bit more disorganized. So we really think that actin polymerization is driving the retrograde flow and myosin is sort of centering it on the center of the synapse. Intriguingly, by inhibiting actin polymerization and myosin contractility at the same time, Babich et al. were able to completely freeze the immunological synapses actomyosin network. For us, that was an exciting opportunity because until now, what had really been done in the literature is that people had put actin depolymerizing agents on the cells or suppressed the expression of molecules that drive actin polymerization. So we knew a lot about what happens when you get rid of actin, but this gave us the opportunity to keep the actin around and have a static scaffold and just perturb the movement of the network. And that would let us ask questions about whether that was required for signaling or just having the actin was enough. In untreated cells, the inward movements of actin and microclusters containing the T-cell signaling protein SLIP76 appear to be unrelated. But freezing the actomyosin network arrested the movement of these microclusters. This was accompanied by a rapid decrease in intracellular calcium levels, which are usually elevated during T-cell activation. That was really very interesting to us because there are a number of other studies where microcluster movement has been arrested using physical barriers or by ligating beta-1 integrins. And in all of those cases, you actually enhance T-cell activation, whereas we were seeing diminished T-cell signaling. So that got us thinking about a model that's becoming very popular, which is that T-cell signaling requires tension driven by the actin flow pulling against engaged receptors. So if you think about that, if you retard the microcluster movement by holding them back with physical restraints, then you're going to actually enhance the tension and enhance the signaling. But if you arrest the machine that's providing the force, you're going to drop the tension and drop the signaling. 
Babich et al. found that arresting actomyosin flow prevented the release of calcium from endoplasmic reticulum stores. Normal calcium signaling was restored by a drug that induces ER calcium release. The researchers then looked to see which upstream signaling events were disrupted in the absence of a dynamic actin network. The early tyrosine phosphorylation events, like phosphorylation of ZEP70 and SLIP76 itself, were pretty much intact. And the earliest phosphorylation change that we could see was at the level of phospholipase C, which is the molecule that's needed for the release of calcium from ER stores. And phosphorylation of PLC, which is needed for its activation, was actually diminished when you arrest the cytoskeletal flow. It's unclear how tension regulates the activation of phospholipase C. It may affect T-cell receptors themselves or downstream components of the pathway. But Babich et al.'s work demonstrates that actomycin flow is essential for the maintenance of T-cell signaling. We've learned that myosin helps to organize the synapse, but it's not really needed to drive actin flow or to promote TCR signaling, at least not in the conditions that we tested. Regarding actin, we've learned that it's not enough to have a static actin scaffold. We need ongoing centripetal flow of the actin network. And we've learned that one key step when actin flow is needed is at the level of PLC gamma signaling and sustained calcium store release. So we're really interested in this issue of tension-based signaling and on the idea that it happens not just at the level of the T-cell receptor but at the level of microcluster components itself. And then I think it comes back to the global question, why would a T-cell want to do this? And so another project in the lab is looking at ligand mobility on the dendritic cell surface to see whether that's modulated under different physiological conditions and whether that is important for T-cell activation. In the meantime, you can learn more about how retrograde actin flow sustains T-cell signaling in the paper by Babich et al., published in the June 11, 2012 issue of the Journal of Cell Biology. Thank you.